Shin was a young boy when the war took his parents away. He didn't understand why his mom and dad were gone. One day, he asked his big brother, Shaori, about it. Suddenly, Shaori gets very angry and suddenly starts choking him and pins him to the ground, blaming Shin. Shaori claims that Shin killed their parents, and soon he will be dead too. Shin lost his life at that moment, but a priest pushed Shaori away and brought him back to life. Since that moment, Shin has been living with a scar on his neck, reminding him of what his brother did to him. But something else happened to Shin. After almost dying, he began to hear the voices of people who had passed away. As for Shaori, he left to fight in the war and never returned. Four years later, something changed for Shin. Among the whispers of the dead, he heard his brother Rei's voice. Shin knew then that Rei was gone. It pushed Shin to make join the military. But the battle Shin was now a part of wasn't just any war. It was a war between two big countries, the Republic of San Magnolia and the Jayadian Empire. Shin used to live in the Republic, but they were losing. And because of that, the leaders made a rule. If you didn't have silver hair and eyes, like Shin, you weren't a true Alba citizen anymore. They were all trapped and had to guard a special camp outside the country's 85 main parts. This camp was called the 86th District. That's how the people there got the nickname the 86. The 86 had to use big battle machines called juggernauts to defend the Republic. They were told to fight for five years. If they stayed alive after that, they would be free. It's the same promise given to Shin's parents. But there was a big lie. The Republic told everyone that no one was getting hurt in this war. That wasn't true. The enemy, the Jayadian Empire, used robots to fight. But the Republic used the 86 as pilots. They didn't think the 86 were real people, so they said the war had no casualties. After spending four years in the army, Shin was known as the Undertaker, the strongest 86 and leader of the Spearhead Squadron. This group had other strong 86 members who had fought for about the same time as Shin. They all had one big hope, to serve for five years and then be free. Something no 86 had ever done before. Shin got the name The Undertaker because of the heavy burden he carries, killing his comrades. He didn't do it because he was mean or crazy. But, if someone on his team got really hurt in a fight, Shin would make a hard choice to end their life quickly. He did this for a reason. He wanted to stop the enemy, the legions, from taking their brains. If the legions got the brains, they would use them to make their robots even stronger. Shin had to make this tough choice over 500 times. Every time, he would take a piece of metal and carve the name of his fallen friend on it. But today is a new day for Shin and his squad because their former commander decided to help with Truck Kun's monthly quota. While on a mission, their former commander could hear the voices of the dead in Shin's head, so he decided to cap it himself. Now, they have a new leader. Her name is Vlad Ilma, in short Lena. She's an Alba major in the Republic of San Magnolia's army. Lena's main job is to sit safely in the capital and lead an 86 group against the Empire's legions. These legions keep getting more powerful every time they take a brain from an 86. Lena has a special tool called a parade to help her group in battles. This tool lets her feel what the 86 fighters feel and talk to them, even though she's not right there with them. What makes Lena different from other Albas is her heart. She believes every 86 is a real person and treats them kindly. Unlike the rest of the Albas who are racist pricks with a superiority complex and treat the 86 as their slaves and call them pigs. One week later after introducing herself and talking to her new squadron, Lena informs that they will be attacked. She's already late, the squadron already knew about the attack and is ready to deploy. There are hundreds of legions against a few twenties of the 86 but that means nothing. Shin's squad takes advantage of the high ground and starts to open fire like madmen. The legion's robots numbers start to decrease very easily before they can even realize what the scraping hell is going on. They manage to finally locate the 86 positions but it's too late. They launch their missiles but they can't even hit the 86 back, it's a one-sided battle. The Spearman Squadron's skills are far better than those automated robots. They easily dodge everything as they take advantage of the terrain and blast those scraps away. Until, they are forced to split up and retreat because of a long-range gunner-type scorpion fire. Lena tries to do her job and provide info, but Shin simply tells her she's useless. Any info she provides will enable the enemy to locate them. Unwilling to lose, Shin charges forward deciding to solo carry this battle. He rushes forward, dodges some missiles, dodges their bullets and jumps on top of a robot shooting it into the junkyard. He jumps back to the streets, dodges more bullets and covers himself behind some demolished buildings to avoid fire. He charges forward again and uses his juggernaut's blade to cut the legion's robot's legs and shoots its scrapyards. To dodge, he launches a cable and uses it to climb on top of a bridge. Jumps right down on top of one, as the legion's robots are confused and blasted, making the robots retreat away. Later, Lena starts to call her squad every day, especially Shin because it's probably her kink. 
But not everyone wants to talk to her, I mean, nobody in the squadron wants to talk to her. Simply because why should they trust the same people who strip their rights and force them to fight to the death and also because she seems to get close to Shin. She's quite a naive girl who believes she's going her best and they're going to win the war and change the world. But for the first time since she joined one of the squad members dies. She tries to apologize to the squad, but some of them start ranting at her for being like just another Alba who sees them as slaves and not humans. That's why she's hiding in the capital luxuries and not on the front lines, but her real sin is that she never tried to learn their real names and only used their nicknames. Lena ends up having an emotional breakdown but she later calls them to apologize and asks for their real names. Everyone introduces themselves and have fun. Shin tells her his name and Lena realizes she knows his elder brother. When Lena was still a kid, her father took her out to show her how badly the 86 are treated. He wanted his daughter to see the reality and fight for a noble cause. However, some Legion robots attacked them while they were traveling on a helicopter. Lena's father passed away, but she was saved by Shin's brother, Shaorei. Lena was the only survivor and was hiding from the Legion's robot. Out of nowhere, Shin's brother appears and dodges the robot's bullets and takes the perfect opportunity to shoot it down. During that day, Shaori revealed that he just wished his five years of service to finally end and go back home to take care of Shin. However, Shin doesn't really have good memories of his brother. When Shin was still a kid, his brother went crazy blaming Shin for their parents' deaths and almost strangled him to death. But it's all in the past, Shaori doesn't want to kill Shin anymore, because he can't, he's already dead. During Shin's early service years, he found the juggernaut that his brother piloted, and well there was a body inside, but he lacked its brain. Weeks later, during another fight, they hear the voice of their previous companion who recently died. Lena starts to freak out when she hears the voices of the dead. Shin gets all mad, the Legion took his companion's brain and turned her into a puppet for the sake of this war. He finds the robot and coordinates everyone in the squad to attack and terminate the robot down, finally bringing peace to her soul. Lena doesn't understand why she could hear the voices, and Shin explains to her that unlike the Republic that uses the 86 to fight for them, the Legion robots are made with the dead 86's brains, enabling them to mass-produce robots that keep evolving. Therefore, the Republic is pretty much doomed. Because once all of the 86 are gone the Republic will have nobody to fight for them. Lena cannot believe it, as she's the typical delusional girl who believes they will end the war before all of the 86 are dead. Sometime later, Shin's squad is all partying around like crazy but once again they must fight. They start moving forward through a forest and dodge the Legion's heavy artillery. The Legion's robots have evolved, they already know the Spearhead most used strategy and tries to avoid it at all costs. But in the other hand, the Spearheads get all hyped up and shoot them back sending them to the scrapyard. But the numbers increase, and one of the juggernauts is blown into a swamp. Another member tries to help her just to get blown away. Some of the Legion's new humanoid robots run into his juggernaut and attach to it to self-destruct. The girl is still stuck in the swamp and can't get away. The Legion's robots approach her and she shoots them with a gun. It has no effect. She's doomed since nobody from the Spearheads can arrive in time to save her and she decides to take her own life. After the fight finishes, Shin checks if any of his previous companions are still alive. The guy survived the explosion but is severely injured, so he puts an end to his misery. Due to the previous events, Lena decides to request aid for her squad. She wants reinforcements, an aerial strike, she wants everything. But she's simply denied. Days later, Shin's squad is ordered to investigate a place that seems fishy and smells like a trap. The Republic will do anything to stop them from being free and send their squad into suicide missions. It is indeed an ambush. The Legion uses long-range cannons to attack them from 75 miles away, wiping half of Shin's squad. From the original 24, there are only 9 left who manage to escape and stay alive. Lita once again wants to request reinforcements from the higher ranks, because they sent new robots and resources, but they won't send new soldiers. The group decides to finally tell Lena the truth. They're almost finishing their five years of service, and the Republic doesn't care about their lives, they don't want them to survive. All those resources they've received aren't for them. It's for the next squad that will come to replace them after they get all wiped out. That's why the Republic decided to send them to that mission and any future mission will also be a suicide mission. Lena can't believe their words, she doesn't understand why they haven't escaped or get revenge on the Republic. They have the Jaggernauts, and it would be easy for them to achieve any of both. The squad's vice captain steps in and tells her they won't feel happy by doing it. They cannot carry the guilt of allowing the legions to destroy the Republic because some Albas helped and protected them in the past. Some of them even decided to fight alongside them. It wouldn't be fair to allow all Albas to suffer and die when some of them have a gentle heart and cared about them. They also cannot let all the 86 deaths to be in vain. 
They fought together, they lived together, and they loved each other. Therefore they must fight for everything it matters to them, even if it means running into their own end. Lena then decides to ask her friend's help, Annette who works for the military research and development sector. Lena wants Annette to help her stop everything, but Annette is a typical Alba who pretty much says everything is doomed. Lena should only deal with it. They cannot do anything to protect the 86 since they're in this discrimination state for the past 9 years, and Lena's sense of justice isn't enough to change the whole Republican mindset. Lena still insists on helping the 86 but Annette gets mad, she knows they cannot change their country's mindset. She knows how Lena feels and tells that before the war, when she was still a kid she used to play every day with an 86 kid. But people started to complain about her connection to an 86 kid, so she decided to reject the kid saying he was just a dirty kid who will never be as pure as her kind. During that same time, her parents wanted to hide this kid's family, because they were friends and couldn't see them suffer with this war. Annette as a kid pulled out the betrayal card and denied such efforts, allowing the kid and his family to be taken away to a concentration camp. Annette tells this is only proof that everything is rotten, everyone is an accomplice in this disgusting society. Even the para-raid system is a device made from experiments on 86 until they die. After their argument, Lena decides to ask the general for help, but he clearly denies it because they cannot allow any 86 to survive. They know they committed a crime against them, a crime that lasted for several years, the only solution they have it's the extermination of the 86. Shin finally hears his brother's voice, he calls Lena to tell her about it. But not only that, he's already planning with his squad to move and finally destroy his brother's robot. And if they manage to stay alive, they will escape and try to find a place far from the Republic to finally live a peaceful life, hopefully as the last remaining five members. They enjoy their last moments in their base and then move out to their final battle. They find Shaori's robot and tons of other legions, their numbers just keep increasing every single time. This time it's five against hundreds, it's impossible for them to win. Shin suddenly hears his brother's voice, he smiles like a madman and starts to slowly move forward. The rest of the squadron starts to follow him, but the legion starts a barrage of high-range attacks. They increase their pace, and Shin only has only thing in his mind, to kill his own brother. He finally finds his brother and dodges his attacks while shooting him back. He continues to dodge and gets the perfect moment to use some heavy artillery but it has no effect forcing him to dodge back. One of the Legion's robots tries to take Shin out but gets shot down by his robot's robot. Shaori is still in control of his robot, even though his brain is inside a Legion's robot. He wants this fight to be one-on-one. -on -one. The rest of the squad is wasting all of their ammunition to destroy all of the Legion's robots, and they start to finally see some hope to stay alive. However, that only lasts for a few seconds, out of nowhere a whole new number of enemies appear, a far greater number. Suddenly, Lena contacts the squad and launches an aerial strike with Annette's help. She finally decided to help because she found out the dirty kid that she cucked nine years ago is Shin. All those years accumulating guilt and the desire to know about him forced her to help Lena. Shin is still fighting against his brother, trying to dodge as much as possible while trying to shoot it back on blind spots. He zipper slides through the three lines, to avoid getting shot, he jumps into the air and uses his blade to slice his brother's robot and shoots a missile to finally finish it. He didn't take into account that his brother's robot is actually made of liquid metal that stops the explosion, and sends some arms after him, he tries to escape but ends throw away. The squad appears to save him, but it's just a distraction. Lena launches a missile towards their location, Shaori wants to personally finish his brother off and protects him from the hit. Shin who is unconscious from his brother's hit, flips his juggernaut up, jumps on top of it, and shoots it down. His mission is finally over, his brother is finally resting in peace to his soul. Shin can finally cry while remembering his few sweet memories of them together. The last remaining members of the Spearhead squad finally decide to get the hell out on their road to a peaceful, and free life, but before they send their goodbye to Lena who bursts into tears, telling her to not leave her alone. A few weeks later after running away from the Republic, the group is trying to find a place to stay but all they have managed to find are fights against the legions. They decide to settle in an abandoned school but they all know it is their last night together, because Shin can hear legion robots near their place, and there's only one juggernaut remaining, Shin's one. As they move, he switches with a companion to drive the juggernaut because he's bored but he decides to go solo and leaves his squad behind. They wonder why, and he reminds them, the one who's driving is the one who has to fight. He jumps to the battlefield and dodges as many bullets as he can while taking robots after robots. He's a one-man army until an ultra-long-range cannon knocks him back. Two more attacks come through, and Shin's juggernaut cannot move anymore, Legion's robots approach him to take his brain. As he's about to be killed his friends come out to save the day. Machine guns against robots, guess who wins, exactly, they're all doomed. 
There are blasts everywhere, taking every single of his last five companions down and the Legion robots are approaching to take Shin's brain. Days after the 86 left in their journey to freedom, Lena goes to their base, where she checks their living conditions and sees their farewell message, where Shin asks her to bring flowers if she ever finds their remains. Lena finds her motivation to fight and protect the remaining 86. After the Republic of San Magnolia's spearhead squadron goes rogue and abandons their handler, Major Lena, she is left alone to reflect on the memories of the bond she shared with them. In search of solace, she enters one of their division's headquarters to meet her uncle, who holds the rank of colonel. As some officers mock her for having different ideals regarding the treatment of the 86, who are regarded as war machines rather than humans, she ignores their remarks and proceeds to have a conversation with her uncle. During their meeting, her uncle scolds her for her handling methods, which have led to complaints from others. Although he still disagrees with her approach, she assures him that she knows what she's doing when it comes to confronting the Legion. Upon leaving the meeting, Lena receives a call from her new squadron leader, Cyclops, who is stationed outside the Legion's region on guard duty. She orders them to stand guard and provide a report while she goes to meet with Annette. Curious about Lena's choice to refer to Annette by her code name, Cyclops wonders why Lena doesn't use her real name. Lena explains that it's her duty as a handler, as she fears the potential emotional attachment that could develop if she were to refer to them by their real names, similar to the bond she had with Spearhead. Nonetheless, Lena still thinks about them and strives to live up to their expectations of her as their handler. She holds on to the hope of one day reuniting with them, should they still be alive. Fortunately, they manage to survive their last sacrificial mission and have successfully made it safely to the Empire of Giant. During their battle with the Legion, they were fortunate to be saved by the new Giant Federacy, which had overthrown the Empire and reclaimed some of the territories previously occupied by the Legion. While Shin remains unconscious, he experiences a dream in which his brother, Shaore, appears. Shaore urges Shin to wake up and continue walking alongside his comrades until the very end. As Shaore walks away, he requests that Shin remember him from time to time and emphasizes the importance of always finding happiness. Shin desperately tries to catch up to his brother, but the distance between them continues to grow until Shaore vanishes. Upon awakening, Shin finds himself in a medical room where individuals wearing hazmat suits observe him through a window. The president of the Federacy, Ernst, enters the room to check on him and introduces himself. Ernst warmly welcomes Shin to Jayad and proceeds to share details about how they managed to defeat the Empire. When Ernst mentions that they discovered Shin and his comrades after the Legion had defeated and captured them, Shin is overcome with panic, remembering the sight of his friends lying on the ground. The windows suddenly become transparent, revealing Shin's concerned friends outside. Before Ernst departs, he introduces himself to the others and assures them of their safety in the Federacy. The friends discuss their recent battle with the Legion, expressing their worry over Shin's decision to face the enemy alone when he knew it was a futile endeavor. Shin apologizes for causing them concern. After a month, Ernst returns to officially welcome them to the Federacy and grants them citizenship. Although initially suspicious of his kindness, he manages to convince them to explore their new home which embodies different ideals. Ernst takes them on a tour through the bustling streets of the city, where the citizens' joy and warmth illuminate the surroundings, something the group hasn't experienced in a decade. They gaze out of the car window, captivated by the beauty and tranquility of the place. However, they also notice protesters advocating for the safety of the 86 back in the Republic. Next, Ernst brings them to his house and introduces them to his adopted daughter, Frederica. He reveals that he has also adopted them, making them his children. As Shin settles into his room, Ernst pays him a visit and presents him with a tag bearing his brother's personal war machine mark, which was found in his old unit. This evokes a wave of sadness and memories for Shin, who sits silently, gazing intently at the tag. As time passes, the group strives to adjust to their new life, seamlessly blending in with the peaceful surroundings. Shin visits the public library in search of a book, which coincidentally catches the attention of a young girl named Nina. He kindly offers her the book, but his cold demeanor scares her off, leading her to run away. However, her brother Eugene retrieves her and brings her back to express their gratitude towards Shin. Although Shin doesn't show much interest, he engages in a brief conversation with Eugene, leading to a newfound acquaintance. Meanwhile, Frederica and Nina also form a connection. As the days go by, the group continues to adjust to the peaceful environment, gradually making friends, much to Ernst's satisfaction. One day, while Shin is sleeping, he experiences a series of abstract dreams involving the fallen 86 seconds who call out to him for salvation from the Legion. 
However, when he attempts to shoot, he realizes he is without a gun. This recurring dream also interrupts his time at the library, where Eugene wakes him up as sleeping there is frowned upon. Eugene invites Shin to attend a military parade, expressing his desire to witness it before enrolling in the academy. He shares his concerns about the ongoing war at the border of Jayad and fears its potential impact on the peaceful town where Nina resides. Eugene wishes to contribute to ending the conflict before it escalates further. Shin neither accepts nor declines the invitation, leaving Eugene to depart with Nina. The parade commences, and the 86 reflect on their duty to end the war. As the day concludes and all return home, Kirina confides in the group about her discontent with peaceful Jayad life. She yearns to return to battle and fulfill her duty. The sentiment is shared, and they inform Ernst, who, despite his initial shock, had an inkling of their feelings. He is reluctant, but Frederica's counsel persuades him. He advises them to enroll in the academy, ensuring a promising future post-war. Frederica then discloses her identity as the last princess of the Jayad Empire, responsible for the legion that decimated many including their families. Yet, they harbor no resentment, recognizing her youth at the time. She expresses her desire to join them, intending to rescue Kyria, her knight transformed into a legion unit. She also shares her unique ability to perceive individuals' pasts and presents, akin to Shin, and her awareness of the events between him and Shaori. They welcome her, and as the new year dawns, they depart from Ernst, embarking on a poignant quest for lasting peace. At the academy, Shin maintains his friendship with Eugene, his teammate in tactical exercises. During a drill, Shin maneuvers his unit in an unanticipated yet skilled manner, narrowly avoiding a collision with Marcel and his partner. This audacious move draws the general's anger. Both Shin and Eugene, along with the involved party, face reprimand and receive penalties. As they exit, Marcel, envious of Shin's superior skills born from harrowing wartime experiences, confronts him. Despite the narrowly avoided accident, Marcel perceives the 86 as monsters of machine combat. In a huff, he pulls Eugene aside. Accustomed to such prejudice, Shin grapples with his own perplexing survival. Lieutenant Gret, the Nordlich squadron's commander, approaches Shin, inviting him and the fellow 86 seconds for a brief excursion. Meanwhile, Marcel warns Eugene about associating with Shin and the 86 due to their war histories. Gret escorts the group to a former Legion-controlled field, now a memorial site. The landscape is dotted with their ancient war machinery, and a monument bearing the names of their fallen peers stands tall. The group, deeply moved by Gret's gesture, expresses their gratitude. She warmly invites them to join her squadron. Frederica arrives with Fido, a pet unit they had discovered upon leaving the devastated Republic. Although damaged, it was meticulously restored by Gret and her operations team. They joyfully reunite with the familiar apparatus and decide to keep it. On their way back, Frederica hands Shin his previous pistol, a memento Ernst had safeguarded. Shin allows himself a subtle smile as his comrades warmly greet him. Meanwhile, in Jayad's western front, the war rages on and the Academy's recent graduates are already in the thick of battle. Eugene, co-piloting a unit with a colleague, finds himself in a perilous situation, cornered by a Legion's unit. Their anxiety peaks as annihilation seems imminent. Just then, a state-of-the-art, swift, and nimble unit named the Reginleaf, steered by Shin, swoops in, forcing the Legion to momentarily withdraw. Back at the base, Eugene, Shin, and Frederica share a meal. As Eugene and Frederica strike up a conversation about Shin, a camaraderie develops. Capturing the moment, Frederica snaps a photograph of Eugene and Shin, before excusing herself, leaving the old friends to reminisce. Eugene shares with Shin his concerns about young people like Frederica being in dangerous situations. He really doesn't want his friend, Nina, to face danger. He feels sad because even though they try hard, it seems like they can't stop the bad guys, and good people keep getting hurt. Suddenly, an alarm sounds, warning them of an upcoming battle. As everyone prepares, Eugene says he'll see Shin afterward. But during the fight, Eugene gets seriously hurt. Frederica tells Shin about Eugene's injury. When Shin reaches Eugene, he sees him really hurt and Eugene asks to see a photo of Nina. Marcel shows up and is upset with Shin for not trying harder to help Eugene. Marcel says some mean things, but Shin is used to hearing them. He tells Marcel they need to be careful because the bad guys might return, then walks away. Back at the base, Raiden and Shin run into each other after what feels like forever. Gret is busy trying to get the big shots on board with her plan to use the 86 squad for testing her swanky new Regent Leafs. They aren't buying it, but she's not giving up. After putting the 86 through some drills, she gets them all together for a chat at the HQ. The whole gang's back, even though they know this reunion might be short-lived. 
When Shin and Frederica return from their little adventure, the talk turns to the Rijin Leafs. Rita's curious about their take on the new gear. The 86 crew give their two cents, and it's not all roses. It ruffles some feathers, but Rita's cool about it. She knows their worth and treats them right, way better than back in the day. Late in the evening, Frederica hangs out with Shin, and they chat about Eugene. Shin's thinking she shouldn't have gotten close to people who face danger, especially after what went down with Eugene. Frederica sees it differently, bonds matter, no matter how short-lived. And, let's be real, Shin was in the thick of that tough Eugene situation. He asks her why she visited him and shares that he kinda reminds her of Kyria. Kyria joined this group called the Legion cause he wanted to keep her safe from some bad guys. But things got messy, loads of folks got hurt, and she became afraid of him. The worst part, Kyria ended up being turned into one of those enemy machines. Now she's worried Shin might end up the same way, and she doesn't want to lose another friend. After their chat, Shin walks her back to her room. Later, he catches up with his buddy, Raiden. They talk about a heads-up Shin gave to Gret, warning her about loads of enemy bots coming their way. But she didn't buy it. Raiden's all, man, keep your special skills on the down low. He's worried that if people find out about Shin's unique powers, he might end up in trouble. They're not entirely sure if the new team they're with is 100% trustworthy. Shin gets it and says he'll be more careful. They're both on the same page about playing it safe for now, especially after Frederica's advice. The big day everyone's been dreading finally comes around. The Legion is going to attack. Shin's super alert and makes sure everyone wakes up early. A lot of people grumble about it, but thanks to him, they're all set and ready for whatever's coming. The atmosphere is super tense. Suddenly, the Legion pops up, and it's chaos. Loads of their buddies on the western side are gone in a flash. Gret can't believe her eyes. There are way more of these bad guys than she thought. Shin is all geared up to help out. Even if Gret hadn't given him the green light earlier, she knows it's go time now. Shin and his squad jump into action and, man, they're impressive. They take down a ton of the enemy units, making things a bit easier for their friends. But there's still a challenge ahead. More of those pesky Legion units are on the horizon. Back at the base, Frederica really hopes she could find her friend Kyria in the midst of all this mess. When she closes her eyes, she has this cool vision which shows her exactly where he's hanging out on the battlefield. And he doesn't seem too friendly. As the 86 Regin Leafs make their big move to the front, a bunch of the Legion's guys start to back off. Frederica tries to give Shin a heads up about Kyria's spot but gets this wild vision instead. She catches a glimpse of Shin really getting into the fight with a big, weird smile on his face. Shin goes full on lone wolf, diving deep into bad guy land. Frederick is super worried he's gonna get hurt. After the 86 seconds show the Legion who's boss, Shin kinda wakes up from his intense mode. Gret gives them a shout to come back since the Legion's playing it safe for now. Once they're back, Frederick is kinda mad at Shin, telling him he's acting just as wild as Kyria. Shin tries to cheer her up. Later, Frederica spills about her vision, saying that the Legions are causing a ruckus in the Republic's 85th district. And just when they're wondering about the Legion's next move, an eerie vision of Kyria pops up and freaks them both out, making Shin rush over to protect Frederica. A huge explosion goes off, and when the smoke clears, it's a real mess. A lot of people didn't make it. Shin tries to keep Frederica from seeing the bad stuff, but she spots the wreckage and the people not moving. He tells Anju to get her out of there. As she leaves, she pleads with Shin not to turn out like Kyria. Meanwhile, the bigwigs are scratching their heads over the new weapon that made the big boom. They call it the Morpho. It punched a giant hole in the ground from super far away. This thing is like no other, and in one shot, it wiped out a chunk of their crew. They've gotta deal with it, and fast. After some talk, they figure the 86 might be their best shot at handling this. Over at the cafeteria, the 86 crew is chatting about the last fight. Shin got so wrapped up in battle that he zoned out and didn't even hear Frederica trying to reach him. They're all kinda worried about that. The condo shifts to the Morpho, where it is it'll be fixed up in a couple of months. Frederica tells them to chill for a bit so they can be in top shape when the time comes. Not everyone's on board with the whole rest idea, especially during crazy times like this. And then Frederica spills that they'll get special treatment cause they're the 86. This gets Kirina all fired up. She's tired of people feeling sorry for them. She just wants to be treated like everyone else. Shin gets a letter from Nina. Remember her. She's the one who's been wondering why Shin did what he did to her brother, Eugene. The moment feels heavy. It's like Shin can see her asking him that very question. That creepy smile of his shows up again. He feels swamped by voices in his head. All of them accusing him of stuff because he's always the one who survives. Before he even gets to open the letter, someone's knocking. The general wants to chat. The big question. 
can Shin hear those spooky Legion voices in his head? Shin's like, yep, loud and clear. This gets the general thinking. He tells Shin he's the man for a big mission. They're teaming up with some pals, including the Republic of San Magnolia, to tackle that Morpho problem. Brett isn't too thrilled about it. She thinks it's too dangerous for the 86. She demands a solid reason. The general says one thing, but in Shin's head, he hears his lost friends whispering it's because they're the 86. After a bit of joking, those ghostly pals of Shin say their thank yous and then poof, they're gone. That hits Shin hard. Feels like everyone just leaves him alone. Out of the blue, he gets this vision of Lena, and she's like, I won't forget you, promise. Shin just nods and says his goodbyes, kinda feeling that this next mission could be a game over for him. As they're riding back, Gret goes all mom mode again. She wishes the 86 crew would hang up their boots and chill out for good. But Shin, nope, he's not having it. No pity party for him. He tells her straight up, look, I'm fighting till the end. Then he bolts from the car, letting her know he's answering to the assault team now, not her. And you know what? Even though a bunch of the bigwigs aren't cool with sending the 86 on a super risky mission, the 86 gang is all in. They figure they got picked cause they're the best peeps for the job. Ernst gets wind of this whole plan and, dude, he's not thrilled. He's like, did they pick the 86 crew cause people think they're just war machines? But he gets told it's all about their literal monster status, not some label. Still, he's all, I'll shut this down if there's any funny business. Greth then gathers her team and takes them to this super old base, deep in enemy land. Once inside, she unveils this rad aircraft thingy that'll zip them right to where Morpho is. Brett's totally geeking out over how cool this ride is. She thinks with Shin's mind-reading power, they'll be smooth sailing, especially with their buddies taking care of other bad guys. But Frederica, she's not buying it. She's scared they'll go in, bust the Morpho, but then be toast on their way out. Shin's like, we knew this was risky, remember. And even though Frederica's concerns are super legit, I mean, who wouldn't want to come back in one piece? The 86 crew knows what they signed up for. Shin pays her a visit in her room, soon after she's directed to return to the headquarters due to her outburst. He questions her reluctance to return, given her insistence on saving Kiria, challenging her sincerity. He believes she isn't showing her true intentions, and this confrontation makes her emotional. Tearfully, she reveals her deep-seated fear, Shin might end up like Kiria and leave her feeling isolated. While her heart is set on rescuing Kiria, she's determined to undertake it solo. She earnestly requests Shin to stay behind, fully aware of his aversion to being dictated. He clarifies that he isn't comparable to Kiria and won't be influenced to take part in combat just for her sake. He emphasizes that for her security, she needs to be in the Federacy, especially given her status as the President's daughter. After spending a month fixing the aircraft, they gear up and set the war units, poised to embark on their mission shortly. Gret rallies them with an inspiring talk, underscoring her deepest wish, their safe return. As they're about to depart, Ernst chimes in, reiterating Gret's encouraging words, but with an added depth of parental concern. His distress about the potential loss is evident, and he hints that such a loss might push him over the edge. However, the team, acutely aware of their perilous odds, receives his concerns with a stoic acceptance. When the time comes, Ernst passionately addresses his forces and allies. As he signals the mission's commencement, his commanders initiate an onslaught on the Legion. In response, the Legion springs into defense mode, inadvertently exposing the Morpho. Capitalizing on this vulnerability, the Nordlicht swiftly makes its move, heralding yet another fierce battle. As they fly closer to the Morpho, they find their path blocked by some of the Legion's machines. Gret, thinking on her feet, decides to let the team out early. This way, they can continue their important job, while she and the rest try to keep the Legion's machines busy. Shin feels a bit worried because this wasn't the original plan. However, before he can even speak, they find themselves on the ground, ready to go. Things get even more nerve-wracking when the aircraft starts to move in a weird way and can't talk to the main base. Still, the 86 team moves forward, determined to reach the Morpho, which is not fully fixed yet. Just as they're about to take action, the Morpho suddenly starts up. Shin hears a familiar voice, Kiria's voice, yelling that he wants to hurt him. This deeply confuses and scares Shin. When he sees Kiria's face, a rush of sad memories hits him. The Morpho shows off its bright, electric-like wings, and with a heavy heart, Shin tells his team to quickly move away. The team speeds away as a huge beam causes a massive explosion behind them. This blast messes up nearby towers, causing radars to lose their signal. But then, Ernst gives a passionate speech, telling everyone not to panic as he helps shield the Federacy from further attacks. When the radar works again, they see that Shin's team is still okay. 
Shin quickly realizes that the big attack came from another direction and tells his team to head that way. As they move closer, they shoot at the new target. But there's a problem. The Morpho has a protective shield that their weapons can't get through. Still, they keep trying. Inside the Morpho, Kyria, who's now kind of controlling it, is shocked to see that the 86 team wasn't hurt by the big blast. Shin hears Kyria's voice in his head, and it's so loud that he can't hear his friends anymore. Then, someone called No Face tells Kyria to move the Morpho away because its shield isn't working right. After a bit of arguing, Kyria finally agrees and stops fighting. Shin suddenly regains his senses when he hears the voices of his comrades, calling out for direction. They're alarmed because the Legion is closing in on their position. Shin suggests they chase after the Morpho. Some members of the Nordlicht are hesitant. They feel it's too dangerous to venture deeper into enemy territory. Faced with this disagreement, the team splits. The 86 chooses to pursue the Morpho, while the rest of the Nordlicht stays back, preparing to face the advancing Legion. The very next day, Shin's communicator buzzes. On the other end is a high-ranking officer, a lieutenant colonel, asking for a status update and offering backup support. But Shin, determined and steadfast, declines. He firmly believes that if they retreat or relax now, all their efforts would be in vain. As the day unfolds, the 86 stumble upon a surprise. Frederica, a young acquaintance from their base, had sneaked into the battlefield. She had hidden herself inside a compartment in Fido, one of their robotic units. This revelation irritates the group, but Frederica stands her ground. She criticizes them, saying they seem eager to face danger and challenges them on their choices, reminding them that they had clear orders to return to their base in the Federacy. Shin, ever the leader, instructs Raiden, one of his trusted comrades, to ensure Frederica's safe return to the base. Initially, Raiden is reluctant, but seeing no one else stepping forward, he eventually agrees. Frederica will ride with him in his combat unit, the Reginleaf. As they regroup and take a break for lunch, Shin hands Frederica a sidearm, a symbolic gesture. He implies that if the battle goes south and they don't survive, she might need it to decide her own fate. Frederica, recognizing the weight of the moment and the significance of the weapon to Shin, promises to return it to him at the base. She expresses her hope, albeit subtly, that they all come back safely from the mission. While on a walk, Raiden pulls Shin aside. He suggests that Shin should take Frederica and return to base, pointing out Shin's unique ability to evade the Legion's notice. Raiden's concern stems from the previous battle where Shin seemed to be acting strangely, almost as if he was under another's control. Shin dismisses this observation, insisting he was fine. He even proposes that Raiden lead everyone back to safety while he undertakes a solo and potentially deadly mission. Raiden, frustrated and worried, pushes Shin against a nearby fence, demanding to know why Shin always seems so eager to face danger alone. The tension between the two rises, with Raiden questioning Shin about his past actions, including the haunting memory of him ending his own brother's life. Lost in his thoughts, Shin finds he cannot provide a clear answer. Raiden confesses he fights not out of a desire for death, but a yearning for peace. He passionately expresses that the entire 86 squad, including him, wants to stand and fight beside Shin. Hidden from view but close enough to hear, the rest of the group listens intently, their concern evident. They recognize the immense weight Shin carries, being scorned by his own sibling and strangers alike. Yet, even as they rely on his unique skills to tip the balance in battle, they deeply wish to support and stand with him. As the team moves towards the Morpho, they pause to look at the beauty of nature around them. Frederica expresses a desire to see the ocean, imagining it to be just as breathtaking. The group comes to a realization none of them have ever seen the sea. Shin appears like he wants to share something but hesitates. Sensing this, his friends suggest that once the war ends, they should make a trip to the beach, including him. That night, while the others rest, Shin takes up a watchful position at the hideout's entrance, with Fido by his side. Frederica joins him for a chat. She reflects on the untouched beauty of the Legion's territory, attributing it to the absence of humans. Shin, however, offers a different perspective. He feels that the land isn't truly alive because the spirits there lack human desires. Drawing a parallel, he shares his innermost feelings with Frederica, revealing that he feels hollow inside, devoid of dreams or hopes for peace and beauty. He doesn't even harbor the simple wish of visiting the beach with his comrades. When Frederica brings up their miraculous survival from the last battle in the Republic and their escape to Jayad, Shin recalls the experience. He confesses that he actually enjoyed it because he fully expected them to die. Yet, they made it out alive, and he can't understand why. 
He apologizes for not being Kiria and for setting him as a sort of target in his life. Frederica, however, can't accept that Shin is as emotionally numb as he portrays himself to be. He insists, telling her that he doesn't truly feel alive. He doesn't even experience the deep loneliness that seems to grow with each friend he loses. He feels like he's aimlessly drifting, without purpose or wanting one. As they journey on, the Legion detects their presence and instructs Kiria to hunt them down. On the route, they confront enemy units that ambush them. Anju is struck and tumbles off a cliff. Thankfully, she's unharmed and her Rajin leaf is intact. But she's trapped, so she remains behind with some supplies, ready to face her enemies. The group shakes off these enemies, only to encounter another set of adversaries blocking their path. Theo steps up, choosing to fend them off so the others can move ahead. As they get closer, Kiria becomes aware of their reduced numbers and gears up for a direct confrontation with Shin. Yet another attack ensues. This time, Kirina steps up, holding the enemies at bay so Shin and Raiden can press on. A menacing beam from the Morpho races past them, making them fear for Kirina's safety. But danger is ever-present, and soon after, Frederica and Raiden are targeted. Acting swiftly, Shin orders Frederica into Fido, directing the robotic ally to take her back to base, while he proceeds alone. Reaching a vantage point to see the Morpho, Shin's battle begins, with a sense of madness overtaking him. In the thick of battle, Kiria's rapid-fire attacks dart towards Shin. However, with lightning-fast reflexes, Shin dodges every strike, leaving Kiria impressed yet on edge. The thrill of combat surges within Shin, compelling him to close the gap and land precise, powerful blows. As he gets dangerously close to the Morpho, Kiria taunts him with a blend of mockery and an odd invitation to join the Legion. Frederica, observing the intense duel from within Fido, recalls a conversation with Eugene. He'd hinted that Shin had a secret weapon, but she knew Kiria had a countermeasure. Desperate to warn Shin, she tried to send a message. Suddenly, a brief moment of clarity pierces Shin's combative trance, saving him from a lethal blow. But this respite is short-lived, as he finds himself staring down the menacing barrel of a gatling gun. Just when doom seemed certain, Raiden swoops in, knocking the gun off its mark, a heroic move that doesn't go unnoticed by Kiria. In retaliation, Kiria releases an electric beam that strikes Raiden, leaving Shin in a precarious situation as his Rajin Leaf's engine falters. With a sense of impending doom, Shin charges the Morpho one final time. But then, a hail of fire interrupts the showdown. Reinforcements have arrived, putting the Morpho on the defensive. Responding rapidly, Kiria activates the Morpho's electric wings, emitting a barrage of lasers that force Shin to retreat and form a protective shield around the mech. For a brief moment, amidst the chaos of the battle, the Morpho disappears from view. The battlefield grew chaotic and intense as missiles rained down. Just when it seemed they would obliterate the Morpho, they instead released oil, which ignited upon contact setting the massive machine ablaze. Kiria's pain screams echoed amidst the fire, his rage focused solely on Shin. But amidst the flames and fury, a vision of Frederica, whom Kiria deeply cherished, materialized. She questioned Kiria's endless desire to end the life of someone he'd never known. Moreover, someone who shared his bloodline. His response mirrored Shin's, he had lost all purpose in life, save for this vendetta. As Frederica tried to ground Kiria in the reality of their shared past, a gunshot rang out. It was Shin's gun, fired by Frederica to catch Kiria's attention. The sight of Frederica alive momentarily pacified Kiria, but his fury soon returned, accusing Shin of manipulating her. Desperate to stop the ongoing conflict, Frederica took a drastic step. She held the gun to her own head, baiting Kiria to intervene. His pleas for her safety echoed loudly, revealing the depths of his affection for her. Yet, his anger was undeterred. In a swift move, Shin evaded Kiria's attempt to seize him and managed to ascend the Morpho. With Frederica's tearful guidance, Shin pinpointed Kiria's location within the machine and dealt the fatal blow. As life drained from Kiria, Frederica witnessed a poignant scene, Kiria moving on to the afterlife, where his brother, Shaore, awaited him. With the brain that powered it now inactive, the Morpho's safety systems failed. A countdown began, culminating in a massive explosion, reducing the once mighty machine to ashes. Shin narrowly escapes death but loses consciousness, overwhelmed by a vivid memory of the time his brother tried to choke him. He's visited by visions of his fallen comrades from the 86, who convey their gratitude for his leadership during the war. The overwhelming feeling isn't pride but guilt, Shin had never wished for their sacrifice nor the immense pressure of enduring the war's horrors on his own. More than anything, he yearned for their companionship. Awakening inside his Rajin leaf, an overwhelming sense of desolation grips him, leading him to vocalize his pain. 
This attracts the attention of a nearby Legion unit that moves to target him. Just as Doom seems imminent, an unidentified force thwarts the Legion. Soon after, Lena worriedly approaches Shin's position. In their swift conversation, he learns she isn't piloting any machine, prompting him to suggest she join him. When Lena connects with her device, Cyclops, it inadvertently establishes a link to Shin due to the similar tech they use. To his surprise, Shin recognizes the voice of a major he's only known by reputation. Struggling to maintain his composure, he seeks to understand her continued fight. Lena passionately explains that the bravery of Shin and the 86 of Spearhead has been her driving force, urging her to battle on, in hopes of a reunion. Her mission, to liberate those who, in turn, had freed her from a life dominated by misguided ideals. This heartfelt revelation deeply affects Shin, instilling in him a newfound appreciation for those who see past societal divisions. Tears of joy stream down his face, happy to finally see her. He addresses her as Major and attempts to open his machine's hatch for a face-to-face -face meeting. However, he hesitates upon spotting another group of Legion units advancing. Fortunately, reinforcements from the Federacy arrive just in time to halt the approaching Legion. Gret reaches out to Shin, expressing her joy at the mission's success and sharing the news that the other 86 have survived as well. The moment they sync up, they voice their concerns, explaining that after the blast, he had gone motionless, causing them worry. Shin's heart swells, hearing the familiar voices of his comrades. Ernst also chimes in, updating Shin about the situation of the 86 seconds in the Republic. He offers them the choice to return, but Shin firmly decides they'll remain in Giant. After surviving the explosion, thanks to Kiria's sacrifice, Frederica approaches. Their conversation drifts to the fact that Shin can only reunite with Lena once the war concludes. Frederica remarks that this will be Shin's new purpose, noting that Lena's journey follows the trail he blazed. For Shin, a future now beckons. The group returns home to Ernst and he welcomes them with presents for the Christmas holidays. They are slightly more cheerful now, accepting this new life of peace at times. They also continue living a normal life like normal people. Shin visits the graveyard to pay respects to Eugene whom he tells his new goals for continuing to fight. Marcel also arrives to pay respects to Eugene too and after slight formalities, Shin decides to leave but Marcel stops him. He confesses to being the one to ask Nina to write the letters she sent, and the reason was because he felt guilty for being helpless in a war that took many lives which he couldn't help. While breaking down, Shin comforts him, and they seem to start to understand each other. Nina arrives there too but passes Shin who's leaving, without recognizing him. She finds the photo that Shin left of himself and Eugene. She's happy to have it and shouts her thanks to a Shin who's now out of her sight. Shin goes to the memorial site to put the tag of Showery's personal mark in a box filled with other tags of the fallen 86 that he kept with him. He can't imagine the future without his brother but the thought of having other people who care about him makes it bearable. Lena visits her home once more which stands lifeless, having been wiped out by the Legion. The survivors got rescued by the other surviving nations like Giant. She heads to the Federacy and gets appointed as the handler of a newly formed squadron that will be sent to continue fighting the Legions and reclaim the remaining territories. While she winds down and recharges in her room, Annette shows her the communication device that the Federacy has, which uses their specs which means they must have studied one that was worn by the 86. She gets the idea that if it's the 86, it could be the five who have already settled there. The next day, Lena goes to meet Ernst who takes her to the memorial site. There, she pays her respects to the fallen 86 who served her republic, and she swears to never forget them and the promise she made to them. Later, she meets with her new team. She's initially confused, not expecting to meet them right now. She introduces herself to Shin's group, mentioning that it's an honor to meet them for the first time. Everyone tries to control their laugh during the presentation but it's impossible. Shin simply replies this isn't the first time they meet, but the first time they see each other. Lena is super confused by his words. Yet, Shin simply says it's been a long time and calls her handler one. He introduces himself as the current captain of the Jayad Federacy and the former captain of the Spearhead Squad. Tears start to pour from Lena's eyes after listening to those words. Both smile at each other in their emotional let's call reunion. Suddenly, the 86 seconds cat that Lena was taking care of jumps out of the bag and runs to the group. They all call it a different name, and Lena realizes who they are. She happily calls them by their names, and they all take a picture together. She tells the group that she's been following them for a long time, and she can finally fight by their side. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.